for those of you who don't know me, which I think everyone does, I'm Alec Ellsworth, the Parks Director for the City of Montpelier. Uh, I've been the Parks Director for um, about a year and 10 months now. Uh, took over for Jeff Beyer after his 39 and a half year tenure with the park. I'm sure all of you know him as well and all the good stuff he did for our city. And um, this is really an extension of, uh, of work that you know Jeff was working on for a long time, which was to grow Hubbard Park and grow outdoor recreation. And it's um, something that we're uh, really excited to bring to the public. Um, it feels like we're at an exciting place with this project. Um, so I'll just give you some context here. This is uh, an overview map. You can see Hubbard Park. Does this thing have a laser pointer? Yes. Any chance we can get that light turned off? Yes, we can. Aha, wow, amazing. Beautiful. How's that? Great. Good. Good. Thank you. see your notes? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so Hubbard Park, and then you'll see the two parcels here. The Haney parcel is in green, and the Johnson parcel is in purple. Uh, they're nestled right in there on the left-hand side. Um, and uh, I'll go back to this map to explain what these other big shaded areas are, because they are they're important. Um, they're. Uh, the Haney parcel is about 50 acres, and the Johnson parcel is uh, about 28 acres. Um, so all in all, we're getting close to an 80-acre addition to Hubbard Park, which is about 175-ish acres right now. So we're uh, almost a 50% increase in the size of the park. Um, here's a little close-up view. You can see Clarendon Avenue here, Deerfield Drive going up here, Hubbard Park drive right there so um, the property is accessed by Hubbard Park and um, there are a lot of folks who live along this is all houses and private property a lot of people access um, through the back of their property and, and as I understand from talking to people in the neighborhood it's a pretty open sieve here through these private parcels where people who might not live adjacent to the park uh, sounds like there's a lot of ways to get in there in both directions Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and um, Jeff always used to say if you, if you sort of put up a ribbon around Hubbard Park, it would not be as big as people thought it was um, around all our parks, really. And I think these two parcels are probably the number, number one and two, maybe, that people might assume are part of the park but are really not. You can, you can pretty easily find yourself on this land, and many people have. Um, accidentally and on purpose for many years um, to enjoy the beautiful um, the beautiful land that's up there. Um, so the first question now that we sort of understand where where we where the where the properties are is why bother with this project? Um, why are we conserving these parcels? Why are we conserving any land in Montpelier at all? Um, and um, there's really three things I want to touch on. Um, the first one is that this project is a small part of a much bigger vision for Montpelier. Um, and the vision is captured in this plan right here, which is called the Montpelier Parks Green Print Plan. And it was developed by the Parks Commission in the year 2008, so it's been around for some time. And um, they, they asked themselves, you know, what would Montpelier look like if we had a seamlessly integrated network of trails and green spaces that were all connected to each other and connected to downtown and connected to the neighborhoods. So people could move throughout town on these greenways in various modes of transport um, and get to and from where they lived and downtown Montpelier. And this is sort of what they came up with. So it encompasses um, a lot of the, you know, obviously it encompasses the parks, Hubbard Park and the North Branch Park here. But these areas that are drawn in green show areas that are, you know, part of the vision for this larger um, open space in Montpelier that can be accessible to the public. Most of these lands right now are private lands. Um, and then it's a little bit harder to see, but the hatched green here um, in a number of places show ways that trails could connect to each other and to different neighborhoods. Um, 
So you'll see um, right over here, these properties are nestled right into a part of this um, green print plan. And it might seem like uh, only a tiny chunk of, um, you know, only a tiny chunk of progress, but it really is a, a huge addition because it opens up um, a lot of potential to move into this bigger uh, northern area here, and also uh, and also the potential to um, create a connection over to, you know, some future. Uh, project over you know on this side of town that could include trails and open space so the first point is that this this acquisition is part of a part of a bigger vision for Montpelier um, oops the second one um, is there are a lot there are a number of important natural features um, that are on these properties um, and I'll point your attention to this map over here um, so you'll see the Haney property here and the Johnson property here. Uh, in blue are all the mapped wetlands um, that are on the Vermont Significant Wetlands Inventory. And then in red are the, um, the only two state significant natural communities that are in the entire city of Montpelier. And what that means is that um, in 2007, the Conservation Commission um, contracted with Brett Engstrom, a local naturalist, or actually a very well-known statewide naturalist, to do a natural inventory of, um, natural resources inventory for Montpelier. And so he went around and looked at uh, a huge swath of the city and identified all the different natural communities um, as best he could, and then identified the ones that were really significant. So we have 20 or so odd ones that were significant for Montpelier, either because they were very unusual or they were very important for biodiversity. Um, and then there were only two right here, one and two, that were significant on a state level because of the same reasons. Not just unusual for Montpelier, but unusual for the state and significant for, for biodiversity in the state of Vermont. Um, which might be surprising, <laughs> because here they are in sort of urban Montpelier, um, but they are on the sort of on the border of this vast swath of forest that really goes all the way up from here, you know, virtually unbroken up to the Worcester Range and to Hunger Mountain. Um, so these these two are on the southern tip of that. What what is the significance, if you may? Um, I am not a naturalist, so I'm not equipped to answer that question. Uh, they're hemlock hardwood swamps, uh -huh. and um, somebody who knows more about nature should answer that question. <laughs> um, so um, there's also uh, more than 12 acres of wetland, and, and if, if any of you have ever walked this property, which I'm sure most of you have, these blue areas do not even come close to capturing all the wetlands on this property. This map was, I'm guessing, made with LIDAR, some kind of satellite service. Um, and this, basically this whole central corridor here, which you can kind of intuit from where the wetlands are, is very wet. So all of this in here is gonna be, uh, would, would almost certainly, um, in, again, my very uneducated opinion, <laughs> be classified as a wetland if it were to be field surveyed. Um, and so what does that mean for Montpelier? Um, wetlands have a number of really important um, functions for our city. Number one is um, this stream here drains north to the North Branch River, and this stream here drains south to the Winooski River. And um, all of the water that is falling on this property or seeping out of the ground is all being captured and filtered by this, uh, you know, this forest, this natural forest land. If you think about um, an infrastructure that it would take to, an infrastructure project that could capture this much water, slow it down, filter it uh, for the city of Montpelier, it would be uh, on, a, on a scale of millions of dollars. So. These are the type of benefits that it's hard to capture, but they are, they're very real for our very flood-prone city. Um, so they're, number one, these wetlands import, perform important stormwater functions. Number two, um, they're important for biodiversity in our city. So 
um, anyone who enjoys seeing wildlife, um, experiencing wildlife while they're out in these natural areas. All animals need to drink, just like we do. And um, sometimes we don't realize that they can't turn on the faucet and drink when they want to. They need wetlands, they need water. Um, I guarantee you every uh, wildlife, every, every animal that's out in this forest living out there knows where these wetlands are because um, they perform a really key, key function. Um, and that's really just scratching the surface of the ecological benefits of wetlands. Again, I'm, that's really not up my alley, um, but um, they, are, they are critical. Um, and then the last piece um, that I'll share is economic development. And so you might be thinking, wait a minute, conservation and economic development? What, what is that? Those two seem like they're at odds with one another. Au contraire. Um, there's a big push in Vermont and, and indeed across the whole country to make the connection between outdoor recreation and economic development. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great data now about what kind of economic development these, these trail resources can bring to communities. Um, so the really marquee one for Vermont is Kingdom Trails. Um, I don't know if any of you are mountain bikers. I'm not, but... Um, Kingdom Trails, I gather, is like the regional destination for mountain biking in New England. And they've had some economic impact studies done. And they're bringing in over $6 million a year in, in new money to the businesses and communities um, that are part of Kingdom Trails. So that's, you know, East Burke, Vermont, uh, $6 million can go a long way. Um, we did a little survey of our mountain bike club to, to ask them, you know, where do you go mountain biking? Do you, do you go to Montpelier? Do you go to Stowe? Do you go to Waterbury? How often do you leave Montpelier? When you leave Montpelier, do you shop? Do you get gas? You know, how do you spend your money at these other places? And just with our little local group, the average was $25 every time they go to Katie Hill and Waterbury or um, Kingdom Trails or any of these local mountain bike spots. Millstone over in Barrie, they're spending on average $25 in food, drink, gas, whatever um, you know, commerce they might be engaging in. So if you think about bringing a thousand people from outside Montpelier to town to enjoy our trails, whether they're hiking to the tower or mountain biking in the North Branch Park, $25,000 um, spent in our local economy if we bring in 10,000 people a year, you know, the number can get really big really quickly. Um, and that's just local people. That might be people living in Barrie, East Montpelier. If you think about folks who are coming, they're not just um, going out for a drink after a mountain bike. They might be, if they're coming from Massachusetts or New York or Canada, they're going to be staying overnight, um, spending more money in town and, and really increasing the vibrancy of our community and our downtown. And our whole pitch with outdoor recreation um, and economic development in Montpelier is that there are a lot of towns in Vermont that have great downtowns, and there are a lot of towns that have great outdoor recreation. There are not very many or maybe no towns that have seamlessly integrated trails and downtown. And that is where we can really position ourselves um, as a destination for outdoor recreation. Um, so again, this is a small piece of that. Um, but we've, we've identified three strategies for economic development and outdoor recreation. Number one is telling the right story, so telling that story about a downtown seamlessly connected with outdoor recreation. Number two is um, growing our large natural areas. <laughs> so that's really where this fits in, to offer more trails uh, for more diverse experiences and longer experiences. And then number three is to connect our trail systems to downtown so that adventures can start and end downtown and also connect them to each other so that people can have longer adventures and then connect them to regional assets like Wrightsville Reservoir, Cross Vermont Trail, um, and on and on, East Montpelier, so that you can sort of grow the choose your own adventure type of uh, offerings that we have in town. Um, and then there's a, a, it's not listed here, but I'll just, <laughs> a slight addendum that is kind of fits into part of a bigger vision for Montpelier, which is that 
Um, over here you'll see in purple, these are all trails that are already on the Haney property. Um, we didn't, we haven't, I haven't mapped them for the Johnson property yet, but it's, it looks similar. Um, so people are using this for, for hiking, for biking, for skiing. Um, and critical neighborhood access, there's over 200 homes in this neighborhood. Um, you can imagine a situation where this property could go into different hands. You know, the Haney family has been incredibly generous over the years with letting people use it. Um, but a lot of people forget, you know, that's all, it's all at their goodwill. It could be closed off overnight. And it's actually a good example of, of how that, that happened in a property adjacent to Hubbard Park on the other side. Property changed hands, posted signs went up, made their own trail system and, and own outdoor recreation and were made it clear that other folks weren't welcome and you know people might have been walking on that property for decades and it can change quickly. So there's a there's a very local piece of this that's important as well. Um, when we when we started this process, um, and a lot of you were were a part of this, you know, we wanted to say to the community um, that lives there, you know, to the neighborhood. Is this something you want? You know, we, we don't want to put any staff or city time towards something that the neighbors don't want. Do you want to see this become a park preserved forever so that people can access it? And the overwhelming answer was yes. Um, and, you know, people just told amazing stories about their experience on this property. Um, you know, one one person who was on Clarendon said that she'd she'd probably been on this property um, every day of the year for 30 years. You know, barring being out of town. <laughs> Can this, talk about intimate relationship? I mean, this is this uh, such a key part of her life. Um, another person told me how when he first moved to town in the 1970s, he used to go to this meadow down here. Um, that's shaded in yellow and have a picnic and read his book every Sunday afternoon. And when he met his wife, that was a tradition that they had. They would go every Sunday, they'd picnic and, and read a book in this meadow that he, he didn't own this property. I mean, he didn't, nobody invited him there. He just found this sweet little corner of Montpelier that was special to him and his family. Um, um, so it, it has a lot of history. Um, and obviously people have great stories about Hubbard Park too. So I wanna cover this um, question, which is what about housing? Because um, this is a very important one. The city has a lot of goals. Um, right here, I just, this is our most recent city council just finished their strategic planning process. And they, they identified these um, six goals as their most important ones. There's a lot of initiatives under each one, but one entire goal <laughs> is create more housing. Um, it's important enough that it, it gets its own high-level goal. Um, so it is critical. And for our department, you know, we don't engage in any project like this without first going to the planning department and saying, "Hey, what is the potential for housing here? What do you see? What what would we lose if we conserve this property?" Um, so that was really step one for us. Um, and this is, uh, you know, my, it's, it's a little bit of dangerous territory of just saying my opinion, but, um, you know, this property has been known by the Haney's who, you know, obviously folks know Haney Realty, incredibly well connected um, realtors for decades and decades. If it could have been developed into a neighborhood, it, into housing, it almost certainly would have. Um, if you look at the neighborhood, and, and, and most of you live there, so you can see the topographic lines, um, pretty much the area where they're far apart is where all the houses are. <laughs> and um, if you look at this property, you have a very steep hill on this side, you have a steep hill on this side, and in the middle is all wetland. Um, so the, the development for this potential for this parcel is expensive, very expensive. Um, and we actually tried to work with the Haney's because housing is an important goal for the city um, and also for them. We, we tried to work with them to have housing be a component of the development of this property. Um, 
And in the end, for a variety of reasons, um, without going too far into the weeds, um, we decided that it was simpler and a better outcome overall to conserve the whole property um, because the housing potential for this property is so low and so expensive. Um, and uh, it, you know, if anyone is curious about how that thought process unfolded, I'd be happy to go further into that. But I'll keep it. I'll keep it at that for now. Um, yeah. All right. So um, just to give you a sense of how this all unfolded, the Haney property has been sort of on and off the market for some years, but. In the, in the fall of 2020, it, it came on the market and, and um, people started talking about it. You know, I certainly heard about it as the, as the um, parks director at that, you know, the newish parks director say, hey, this property's on sale. Is there any chance it could become part of the park? And what's the story with it? And so we started thinking about it. We had these neighborhood community meetings, which most of you came to, um, to assess the interest. We talked to the planning department and the city council and the and the property owners, and um, we decided to move forward with this grant application for, through the community forest program to pay for half of the parcel. Um, in the interim, um, let me just go back here to the Johnson parcel. I guess you could see it here too. Um, in the interim, this woman, April Johnson, was interested in having her land become part of the public uh, benefit. You know, she she is motivated to see it be enjoyed by everyone, and so um, we were able to actually include her property in the project through the grant application, um, which was a real a real blessing um, because we did end up getting the grant, and they're willing to fund basically half of the project cost. Um, so once we got that, it was real, <laughs> um, very real. And um, we uh, concurrently applied for $150,000 through the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, AKA VHCB, which is the maximum they'll give for um, a local conservation project, what they call local conservation. And um, we go before the board on, on uh, December 7th. And so that's not in the bag yet, but it's, it's expected. Um, and then we got $38,000 in pledges just from local folks. Um, right off the bat, and our initial ask way back in January, before we had $250,000 in grant money and before any applications was, hey, if this became a reality, what are you willing to throw in? And if we can show the grant funders that we have some percentage of this project in the bag, they're gonna be a lot more likely to fund the project because they're gonna see that local support. Um, so that was really critical, that $38,000. That went into every application, <laughs> it was highlighted. And um, it was a strong part of our of our pitch, um, not only to the grant funders, but also to, you know, our local local council and local decision makers to say, you know, people aren't just telling me they want this; they're they're willing to throw down money for it. Um, so there was a long and twisted road that I won't recover. I won't recount every twist to how we got um, purchase and sales agreements with the landowners, but. Um, uh, fairly recently, within the last few months, after the appraisals came in, we got purchase and sales agreements um, with the landowners, and um, we, after all is said and done with all the expected money between the pledges and the different grants, uh, we're about $100,000 short. Um, so we launched this capital campaign um, to try to close, close that gap by the end of the year, and um, that's how we find ourselves here. Um, we're host, hosting a number of upcoming events. Um, we have a Zoom meeting tomorrow night uh, for folks that want to learn more about the project. We have a fundraiser planned uh, and more fundraisers in the works, um, but we're just rolling them out, so we'll, we'll certainly let folks know. Um, we also have uh, four walks of the property with the Parks Director, Alec Ellsworth, that's me. Um, tried to put them at different times and, and days of the week so that Folks could join if they want, if you want to. And yeah, we've got these dates and times on a handout if any of you would like to take one on your way out. Um, yeah, if, if you want to actually put boots on the ground and spend time um, on the property with me and, and sort of look at it through the eyes of, of the park, um, 
I'm really excited for those because they're beautiful pieces of land. Um, and I know that there's a lot of familiarity with them uh, already, so I, I expect to learn something on those walks as well. Um, and then as far as you know, how folks can help, um, obviously donating um, is really the key to making this progress, this, this project successful. Um, uh, a lot of folks who pledged came back with more money. You know, they said, well, I'll, I'll pledge this and then I'll also pledge more. Um, and so that's great. A lot of people have learned about the project and, and, and thrown in some money. We put a little option to donate extra to this project on the Enchanted Forest tickets and raised $500 through that um, and, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty well for just basically having launched this. Um, we got $10,000 right off the bat. Um, so I'm hoping that these info sessions will generate some more um, interest and some more momentum, and we'll certainly um, we'll certainly be pushing it. If there's been a little bit of a lull the last few weeks for um, just because my personal life uh, had some bumps in it um, with a, a death in my wife's family. But um, now that things are back uh, in the groove, sort of <laughs> in, in my work life, we're going to be pushing it a little harder. And special shout out to Jana over there for sort of keeping the train rolling. Um, and really making making a lot of this possible. Um, so Jana, Jana is a key part of this, as well as the rest of our community services team and our parks team. Um, yes. Questions? I'll keep the keep the light on so we can. I know taxes are not tax deductible. Um, are you emphasizing that contributions to this are? They are. Yeah. Great. Yep. They're all tax deductible. It seems like that's an important thing to emphasize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? I've got one else. Um, as far as the mountain bikers go, my nephew is a huge mountain biker and he loves to go to Burke. Yeah. And he travels over from Maine to go to Burke. Goes out of Alabama. I mean, he'll just go anywhere to ride. Yeah. Um, and I think he's fairly um, environmentally conscious. But I wonder about erosion on the trails and things like that, and how hard it would be to maintain the trails if we suddenly get lots of bikers. Yeah. Um, well. I've had a number of people come up to me and say, well, I'd love to donate X dollars if you can guarantee that we're going to have a bike trail from here to here. And that's not really how it works. <laughs> I mean, I wish I could promise everybody has their own little interest for what's going to happen um, to every, every part of the park, not just these parcels. <laughs> um, and that's our job to manage that. Um, but you know, what we're trying to do here for, for all the mountain bikers who are really keen to see more property is have this be part of the mix, you know, let be part of the conversation. There's going to be a public process to figure out what the trails are going to be, um, what uses are going to be allowed on it. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, for one thing, like I, I can't guarantee that there will be mountain biking trails on the parcels. I mean, that's not really up to me. It's up to the community and the Parks Commission to decide on that kind of rule. Um, and there will be a, a process to figure that out if and when we purchase this land. Um, and just you know, about the second part of your question about erosion and and there's you know certainly mountain bikes are a lot more taxing on a trail system than walkers. Um, and that there's there's just no no getting around that. Um, and we have a lot of mountain biking trails in the North Branch Park, and we you know we're we're fully aware of what it takes to maintain a mountain biking trail. Um, so. We have great staff, you know, that knows that work. We have a ton of volunteers. We have a mountain biking club, Mamba, Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association, um, that puts in untold hours to maintain those trails. Um, I have the thousands of text messages from the group chat to prove it. Um, and I'm confident that if, if mountain biking is part of the mix on this property or any property, you know, that the city owns that we're, we're prepared to take on the maintenance of that. Yeah. I've been on the, on the uh, trails at North Branch and they seem kind of, they're very obviously mountain bike trails. Yeah. The, the gouges and totally. they love to fly. 
totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's a there's a pretty huge range of what a mountain bike trail can look like from a, you know, a little raked pathway that someone rides through the woods to a bur totally bermed out flow trail like we have in the North Branch Park and you know, we we're trying to um, we're trying to get some trails that are kind of in the middle of the spectrum, you know, as far as thinking about the the lands that, you know, the public lands that we own. Aside from this, you know, we have a number of trail projects in the works and we're trying to develop trails that can be both um, walked on and biked on and also skied on in the winter because, you know, it's Vermont. <laughs> so um, a lot of the trails that were built in the North Branch were, were very mountain bike specific. And sort of our next like tranche of trail building is going to be try, try to be more of a true multi-use trail um, that's wider, you know, less fewer berms and, and cuts and things. And, and make it both more beginner friendly, but also, you know, more multi-season. Yeah. So there's a little bit more than two months to get $90,000. What's the strategy if we don't quite get there? That is a good question. That's a good question. Um, well, we're going we're gonna to push hard to try to make it. Um, I think we can make it. I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, if we come up short, um, there, there's more pressure, there's more time pressure to buy the Haney property than there is the Johnson property. Um, so because it's a pretty complicated mix of like, you know, multiple different grant sources and private dollars, um, what we really want to do is purchase the whole thing all at once and, you know, take care of all our grant management and all our donors and just make it very clean, like this is one project. But in theory, you know, we could purchase the Haney property by the end of the year um, because that's their wish and work with um, the Johnson property. You know, who, as I mentioned, is, is somebody who's more, you know, their whole motivation was to put this land into public use, so. So we would have money now to purchase the Haney property, presumably. So there's not a, I mean, I'm sure, let's work hard to get to 90,000, but it doesn't sound like we're on a cliff where we stand to lose it all. It sounds like we're in a pretty good position. Yeah, I mean, we, we only have, a, our purchase and sales agreement is over at the end of the year with the Haney. So yeah, if, if we don't purchase it by then, then, you know, we, we're, we would need to renegotiate. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Right. Um, we, it's this, our, our option with the Johnson property is the same, but, you know, it sort of, more uh, my guess is that's, that's more flexible, yeah. Is the Johnson parcel included in this 90000 deficit? Mm -hmm. It's the whole thing, yeah, the whole, the whole project, yeah. yeah. So the whole project's 55000 550000 somewhere in there? Somewhere in there, yeah. yeah. Have you met with Maple Capital yet? Oh, you have not. No. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Tell me more. <laughs> I think you should. Just to meet with their their um, their shareholders or whatever their client, and see if there are any well, of their clients have I stock giving. Maple or... Capital is going to continue your, your flow through for the Haney property. Yeah. Gifts other than cash. Yeah, that that is the city's the city's uh, stock. I don't know how you describe it. Obviously, I don't know about these things. The city's shareholder investment, investment manager is Maple Maple Capital. <laughs> um, so our finance team, which does not include me, has met with Maple Capital to figure out how to take stock donations. Um, is that is that what you mean by that, or was there like a further? No, no, that was what I was Okay, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. exchanged a few emails. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, I thought there might have been a further fundraising opportunity through Maple Capital. But no, if someone wants to donate stock, then yeah, by well, all they, means. They're all runners. They would be. They, they run up Bailey <laughs> Avenue at lunchtime and go to the park, I think, and then come down. So maybe you could hit them up for some money. Too. All right. Say no more. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and they manage the senior center fund as well already. So oh, nice. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to any and all ideas at this point. 
Have you gotten any negative feedback? No negative feedback. Um, you know, people have questions, you know, yeah. specifically mostly about housing. Yes. Um, because that's, I think, on everyone's mind. Um, and then a lot of questions that we face, like we face with any other parkland, you know, about management and how you, how you're going to take care of this land and staffing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so they're all good questions, but nobody that's been like, I think this is a terrible idea and, right. you know, I don't want to see it. I'm going to actively work against you. <laughs> Alex, someone asked me recently um, how likely it might be that an additional shelter um, would be constructed if that's feasible on the land somewhere, and like kind of how how uh, the team is imagining access, like you know any little parking lot like we have at the couple different entrances to Hover Park currently. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you I'm glad you passed that on because um, that's a critical point that. We talked about it in our neighborhood meetings, but I didn't cover here, which is that, um, let me go back to the map. Do, 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 do. Um, so, as far as access goes, you know, one of the great parts about this project is it, it formalizes permanently the neighborhood access. Um, and that's not just for the abutters, but there's also a right of way that goes right through here out to Dairy Lane. It's just a 16 foot uh, swath of land that can go to Dairy Lane. And this is a really key point that I want to emphasize is that we, we do not intend to direct people to get to Hubbard Park by that entrance. There can be no parking facility, uh, it will be a very low key neighborhood access. Um, and you know we'll work closely with the folks that live adjacent to that to make sure it's as, as minimally intrusive as possible. Um, like I said, it's a pretty leaky border. You know, people go in how they want to go in, or, or whatever relationships they have. Um, but that is that is the main plan to access. We don't plan to build any parking area or anything. Um, basically, keep it as a neighborhood access. Um, and then, as far as shelters go. Uh, Purchasing this land with federal, the federal program is quite restrictive. Um, it can never be developed. And um, there are some openings for you know, recreational structures or things of that nature. Um, and that is really sort of out of, at least you know, my decision making at this point, that is really up to the Parks Commission um, you know, and the public who so they draw from and they hear from is, you know, if, if, if somebody wants a shelter there, then that could be a project that would be discussed in the future. Um, my personal opinion is, you know, at this point, I think if we were to gain these properties as part of the park, we would need to focus on um, formalizing the trails. Like you could see that it's a crazy rat's nest of trails over here. We would need to close down the ones that go through wetlands. We would need to improve the ones that are good. We, you know, potentially create new ones. Work with the neighborhood to figure out, okay, where do we really want trails? And then let's sign them so that people know where they're going. Let's put, you know, no trespassing private property signs at the edges where all these like little neighborhood trails are. Um, and that would be our priority: is to like get get these properties to look and feel more like Hubbard Park before we really go into any kind of shelters or that, that's not at least on my personal short list for this project but again that's not entirely up to me. Can we sign up for one of the walks and what is the maximum capacity for that? Uh, I don't think we have a maximum capacity for the walks and you can just show up there's no sign up and just I'll be there and you can come. Okay. I'll be there rain or shine and or snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, depends on how far we want to go or how hardy how hardy the group is. Well, the first one will be dark. Right. Yeah. Bring your it's getting there. It's gonna get there. I tried to make that the latest one so that maybe we have light to get back by. But... Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Well, that was. Thank you. Relatively short and yeah. sweet. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you all coming. And, and spread the word. Huh? Spread yeah. the word. Good luck. To you. If you have any friends or neighbors or family members that might be interested in supporting the project, we have some 
uh, some pledge and donation forms here. Also a pile of these um, events. To relay the story that <laughs> I think I go in differently than you all go in. Yeah. Yes, that's the, that's why I'm. You probably don't have you a want to go, down, go downhill. Yeah. Turn left and go downhill. Got it. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. When I first moved to town, I lived on Clarendon Avenue. I was telling you, uh, some of you, and I used to walk back here. Um, I lived down here, and I would walk and walk all in here, and I go up, and there's this huge plateau up here. And oh man, I had so many great times just walking and walking. And then one time I got lost and I popped out right over here, like onto the Seven Fireplaces Road, which is like a huge road, you know, it's like a, you, you cars can drive on it. And I was like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> and my first, honestly, my first reaction was like, this is awful. <laughs> that was like this super developed trail. And, uh, you know, obviously I've grown, <laughs> grown to know and love the variety of trails in Hubbard Park, but boy, I spent months and months just before I ever made it into the park or to any of the shelters or anything, just exploring all this private land right. trails. There's a lot out there. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all for your support. And we do have a Zoom event tomorrow night at 7.30. Better hop on the Zoom. Um, Happy to send them the link. And uh, Steve has just recorded tonight's event for Orca, so we'll have that recording, and tomorrow's will be recorded as well. Super. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve.